Hello and welcome everybody to Kubernetes online masterclass series. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, we have uh, hundreds, uh, probably close to a thousand registrants for today, and we are expecting many hundreds of you to join uh, as every week. This is a new series that we started about a month ago. Uh, we have had four classes. Um, each class in the series is about an hour long. Um, with, and, and then we leave enough time for Q&A. Sometimes if it makes sense, we do Q&A in, in between as well. Um, so we have done, uh, covered a lot of topics. Uh, in fact, here is a list of uh, some of the topics that we have covered and are upcoming. Uh, last uh, last week, we, we talked about up and running with Windows Server containers. And today we are going to talk about preventive security for Kubernetes enterprise deployments with AquaSec. Uh, if you uh, are... Uh, interested, then we also have uh, 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 a session on CI/CD pipelines. We have a session upcoming on uh, monitoring. Um, we, we have more sessions on security uh, and then how to successfully run databases in production. Um, we have a page. Uh, you can navigate to rancher.com, Kubernetes masterclass with hyphens, and you can see the list of all the sessions that we have, as well as uh, the speakers for those sessions. We also run a training, which is a beginner training in Kubernetes. And for that, you uh, you have to go to rancher.com slash training. Um, and then this is every Thursday, we run about an hour, hour and a half long training on how to get started with Kubernetes. And it's again, very popular class that we have. Um, just to get you started, we, we only talk about what Kubernetes is and, and not so much about Rancher unless we are asked about it. And it's gonna be the same thing for this masterclass as well. We only talk about Kubernetes and how to make it uh, whatever topic we are picking. So this time it's gonna be about preventive security. Um, and then we answer questions. So uh, we have Liz Rice, uh, who's gonna to talk to us about security. Liz has been in the container space for a few years and she has uh, been focused on uh, security for the last several years as well. She runs open source projects for AquaSec, uh, including KubeBench and KubeHunter. She's gonna talk about those today. Um, she has also written an ebook and a white paper. And if you navigate to AquaSec's uh, website, you can definitely find those there. Uh, so if you are looking at security and if you are wondering what to do about security and how to make Kubernetes more secure, Liz is definitely one of the top speakers in the world that you can come to. Um, before I hand over to her, just a little bit about security in general. Um, I, I uh, during my investigation and my work, I found that security is a very complex issues, uh, a very complex issue in Kubernetes, uh, starting from what it means to how to deal with it, how to solve it. Um, this basically includes Kubernetes settings, CIS benchmarks, host VM infrastructure, open source image, container image, registries, runtime security, network firewall, and I can go on and on. So anybody who has dealt with security in the world of Kubernetes, you understand how complex it can get and uh, how, to, how difficult it is to even define it. What Liz is gonna talk about is preventive security, how to start Kubernetes in the right way, uh, how to make sure that it is set up the right way, how to find issues with the Kubernetes setup in the first place. And most of the Kubernetes attacks that have happened in the world today have happened because it was preventive security measures were not taken. There are tons of other issues like runtime security, um, and you definitely have to deal with those too. But if you if you start the right way in the first place, uh, if you put all the preventive measures in place, there's a good chance that your Kubernetes environment is gonna be secure as you go forward. Okay, so with that background, I'm gonna hand it over to Liz. Um, and Liz, Please take us through um, the security. Let me make you the presenter. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Let me uh, try to share my screen. Okay, uh, can I just get a confirmation? Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Perfect, great. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us today, this morning, this afternoon, depending where you are in the world. I'm in London where it's uh, it's the afternoon. Uh, so today we're going to talk a bit, as Anko says, we're going to talk about uh, preventative security, the kind of things that you can do to secure the control plane of your Kubernetes cluster up front. Um, we'll talk a bit about uh, how Kubernetes can be configured with security in mind. 
We'll talk about some benchmarks that come from an organization called the Center for Internet Security and how we can test whether a configuration or whether a cluster meets those best practice guidelines defined by the CIS. And we'll talk a bit about penetration testing for Kubernetes clusters. Before we do that, uh, well, Anka already kindly mentioned the, the book that I co-authored uh, along with Michael Hausenblast. It, it says here from Red Hat, I believe that as of two days ago, he actually moved to uh, AWS, but another, um, I think, well-known member of the Kubernetes community. And the two of us wrote this, this book that you can download for free from the Aqua website, aquasec.com. And hopefully you'll find that a useful resource for talking you through a lot of different things that you can do to improve the security of your Kubernetes cluster. Aqua is a company that provides enterprises with solutions for securing their containerized deployments. And, and these days, many of those deployments are running Kubernetes. Uh, I won't dwell too long on this slide. Uh, really, what I wanted to highlight here is our belief in automation. DevOps has taught us all that uh, in order to improve business agility, we need to automate our, our testing, we need to automate our deployment, we need to automate the way we get code from developers into production. And Security can be added into that automation as well. So what we refer to as DevSecOps, DevSecOps, um, putting security measures as far left in that CI CD pipeline as we can and doing as much through automation as we can. That really fits with the philosophy of DevOps. And as we'll see in this uh, discussion today, there are lots of things that you can do to automate testing whether your Kubernetes uh, cluster is set up in. I'm, I'm, I'm loath to say that it's set up securely because uh, one of the things that you learn in security is that, that nothing is ever really secure. It's just more secure. We can improve security but it's very hard to it's like proving a negative it's very hard to say that something is categorically secure but we're aiming for more secure we're aiming for a sufficient level of security to address the risks that you are concerned about in your cluster so if we talk a little bit about the pipeline a very very simplified model of the ci cd pipeline has us writing software, testing it and building it, and then deploying it into the cloud. And as Anko was saying, there are lots and lots of different things that we can do to improve security. Many of those different things can, we can think of them as actions along different stages of the CI CD pipeline. For example, we want to write secure code, we want to test our software, our application software for security, and we want to scan our container images for known vulnerabilities. I'm skipping over that really, really briefly, but if you were to do those things, you would have container images that, to the best of your knowledge, were free of security defects that an attacker could exploit. So you'd have good quality software images that you're going to deploy. Host configuration, we're going to run that software on some host machines. And we want to know that those host machines are configured according to best practices. And that's what we're going to really be concentrating on in today's sessions. When we're also thinking about this deployment stage, we want to know that the images we, we're going to deploy actually meet the criteria that we might have. So we might have rules about checking that those images don't have 
no, that well that they have been scanned for for known vulnerabilities and that those that scanning didn't come up with any uh, high severity issues. So when we deploy code, we're basically using automation to make sure that we're running the code that we expected to run and that the code is configured correctly and the hosts that code runs on are configured correctly. And then the final stage is runtime. Our application will be running and we could use uh, anomaly detection. We could check whether the software we're running is behaving as expected. And if it were to be behaving in some kind of unusual anomalous way, that might be an indication of some kind of, uh, well, some kind of attack perhaps. Um, so we might at runtime want to detect those kind of anomalies. Really the point of this slide is, is to echo what Anka was saying in his introduction about there being many, many different facets to security. But what we're gonna concentrate on here is the configuration of the hosts that we're running this, this software on. And uh, in particular, the configuration of the Kubernetes components running on those hosts. So, how do we know how to configure Kubernetes in as secure a way as possible? There are lots and lots of different components of Kubernetes. You know, there's, um, there's proxies, there's kubelets, there's API servers, there's um, controller managers, there, there are all these different pieces, etcd. And every one of those components has some configuration parameters. Some of those configuration parameters can have really quite significant uh, impact on how secure the, the installation is. A really good example is that there's uh, a Kubelet API. So every node in your cluster is running a component called a Kubelet. And the Kubelet takes requests from the control plane to say, well, it's asked to run pods, start and stop pods. If you have access to that API, you can ask the kubelet to run any software you like. Essentially, having access to the kubelet port, right access to the kubelet port, is the equivalent of root access across your, well, on that node. And if you have it on one node, you probably have it on all nodes. There's a configuration setting when you're installing the kubelet that uh, tells you whether or not you are going to allow anonymous users to have access to that kubelet port. That's almost certainly not what you want to do. <laughs> if you want to stop anonymous users from running any software they like on your nodes, you probably want that configuration setting to prevent anonymous access. Now, the default settings that you get for all these different components very much depend on which tool you're using to install Kubernetes. Um, we've seen that there, there are various different tools, things like KubeADM, which is now really the default installation tool. But there's things like COPS and Cube Spray, um, and of course, in some cases, you don't even have, if you're using a, a, a cloud provider's installation, you don't even get to install it yourself because you're given a, a managed control plane. Whatever tool is used to install Kubernetes may well have its own set of default configuration settings. So we have all these different config settings across the different components. How, as a, as a user, and perhaps as someone who's not necessarily an expert in Kubernetes, how can you know which configuration settings, how to set those configuration settings in order to be as secure as you can? Fortunately, there is an organization called the Center for Internet Security and they 
produce benchmarks. These are documents that describe what's considered to be best practice for configuring various different uh, software components. There are benchmarks from the CIS for all sorts of different uh, pieces of software. And Docker and Kubernetes are examples of the benchmarks from the CIS. So this Kubernetes benchmark is some 200 pages full of guidance around how to, how to check what each configuration setting is and what the recommended values for those different settings are. It would be extremely time consuming to manually go through the whole benchmark and check the configuration of, it would be terribly time consuming to do it on one node. And in practice, you want to run those tests on every node in the cluster. So in order to automate that, as I said right at the, the beginning, automation is our friend. Automation is key to, to the whole DevSecOps approach. So we need to have these tests automated. And at Aqua, we wrote a tool called Kubebench to automate running the CIS Kubernetes benchmark tests. So you'll find this tool on GitHub. It has the tests uh, and also the configuration in YAML format. We have different tests for Kubernetes masters and, and nodes. And you would essentially install it on every node that you want to test. This is kind of uh, an example of the kind of output that we get, but I'm sure we don't really want to just see a static uh, you know, screenshot. So let's actually run it for, for live. So hopefully you can see my, my screen here. I've got a single node uh, Kubernetes cluster running on my laptop here. Uh, and we'll just check that the, the nodes are up and running, or the node is up and running. There it is. So I can just run, I'm going to run the node tests, the worker node tests on this machine. And it very quickly comes back. And actually, it's pretty unhappy about this. 12 checks have failed the way I have this particular uh, installation set up. If I uh, scroll back to the beginning, you can see there's a, a pass fail or occasionally warning for all the different tests. And uh, let's take a, an example here. I'm going to take this second one. Ensure that the anonymous auth argument is set to false. So this is what I was talking about earlier, where we want the kubelet. This is kubelet tests. We want the kubelet not to allow anonymous access. And this is the setting that controls whether anonymous access is allowed. So I have a bad configuration for this setting at present. And if I scroll down a bit further, we can find the remediations. So these remediations tell us how to address the different problems that the test might find. So I'm going to uh, remediate this. We'll take a copy of that file name. And I need to be super user to, to edit this. And there is the setting in questions. I can uh, drive my keyboard. There's the setting in question that we don't like. Anonymous source is currently enabled, and I'm going to change that to false. I need to restart the kubelet service. So hopefully that will be restarting uh, restarting my node. I just need to make sure that the node is ready. It's not yet, but by the time I type in watch, it probably will be. And yes, there it is, it's ready. So now that it's ready again, I can, I'll clear the screen and run the test again. And this time we can say, see that 
10 checks passed, last time it was nine. And if I scroll up to the beginning, we'll find that that particular test has been successfully remediated. So you would typically run these tests on, on your cluster. Uh, you might not always agree with every setting, every recommendation from the benchmark, but it's a good idea to at least understand why. Um, it, there may be particular tests that don't apply in your environment, and, and, and that may be okay, but it's, it's, it's a good place to start to ask the question, should I be worried about failing this particular recommendation? So that's KubeBench. The uh, configuration is all um, set up in YAML files because everybody loves YAML. There is not enough YAML in the world. Uh, you could run KubeBench as a, uh, as a container or even as a Kubernetes job you would typically want to run that on a regular basis across the cluster just to make sure that the configuration hasn't changed. The tests themselves are also defined in YAML and that allows you, if you decide that for whatever reason, you, you want to behave differently, you want to use a different setting for, for one of the recommendations that the, the CIS uh, documents, you can easily modify those YAML files. So once you've decided what your configuration should look like, and you can easily set up the tests to, so that you can get a clean pass you know, every time meeting your needs. We follow the CIS benchmark. So, so one thing that uh, comes up sometimes is uh, the fact that the benchmark doesn't you know it, it it's written by uh, like many things in the open source world it's written by essentially volunteers um i i do get involved with with authoring some of that benchmark myself as well and uh it typically doesn't get a new release for in step with every kubernetes release so uh there is a new uh, version of the spec for Kubernetes 1.13. The previous version was for 1.11. Uh, but usually, the, the, and particularly these days, the, the amount of change between one Kubernetes release and the next is, is not, it, it's not so great. Uh, and you could always modify the test if there was something you felt particularly strongly about. If you want to get involved in the CIS, it, it is uh, a community that welcomes more uh, contributors. So, um, so, you know, speaking as one of the authors on that benchmark, we, we would certainly welcome more, um, more involvement, more people uh, contributing to that spec as Kubernetes evolves. If you're an Aqua customer, we also build the Kubernetes benchmark and a very similar tool for, for the Docker benchmark that checks the Docker configurations. Um, we actually build that into the uh, Aqua platform. It's actually running exactly the same code. You're getting exactly the same tests, but you, you, you get a, a nice UI view onto the results. So Kubebench, checks whether or not the configuration settings are um, before you oh. before you go forward uh, there mm -hmm. are a few questions we can take on cube bench okay sounds good okay so the first question is uh, how about um, cloud providers does does uh, can you use um, uh, cube bench for eks gke aks are there any restrictions Right, okay, so there are a few uh, restrictions and things to be aware of for the different cloud platforms. In theory, yes. The reality is quite often you don't have access to the uh, control plane nodes, and if you don't have access to the control plane nodes, you're um, going to struggle to run the control plane tests you're more likely going to have access to the um, to the worker nodes, and, and that, would, that would mean you could run the, um, the, the worker node tests successfully. Uh, 
There is another um, issue that I'm particularly aware of for EKS. Um, now, the CIS benchmark defines this set of tests and it currently looks at the running processes uh, for each of the Kubernetes components. So it's literally doing a PS command to see the running process and the parameters that were specified when that process was started. Uh, so one of the ways that you can run Kubelet, for example, you set up, I mean, you saw me editing the service file, that those parameters actually end up as uh, executable parameters that you can see if we look at PS. In fact, I could show that uh, just to sort of demonstrate what I'm what I'm talking about here. So if I uh, grep for the kubelet process running on this node, uh, oh, that's weird. I would have expected to see <laughs> kubelet running on this node. <laughs> That's what happens if I try and make up uh, live uh, live demos. Yeah. Let's just try a cube. Okay. Here we go. Um, there it is. There's there's Kubelet, and we can see a number of these parameters. And there, in fact, is the anonymous auth parameter that we were um, changing uh, in my demo uh, moments ago. Now, the CIS spec expresses the recommendation by saying, run PS, look for the kubelet process, and check for this dash dash anonymous auth. There is a newer way or an alternative way of configuring uh, the kubelet uh, parameters through a kubelet configuration file, which is a JSON file or, or YAML file where Kubelet can pick up those parameters. And in that case, you would see uh, something like dash dash Kubelet configuration and the name of the file. And then Kubelet would know to, to pick out the, uh, the configuration from that file. The CIS benchmark does not currently sort of um, express, even though it's very obvious how you would map one um, each of those parameters to the configuration file, strictly speaking, not currently what the CIS recommends. That said, we're working to address that, and, and obviously it's a, it's a perfectly reasonable way to configure your, um, your Kubernetes cluster. So um, <laughs> if you really, really follow the strict letter of the law, the CIS benchmark, what the EKS doesn't, you would run those tests and it wouldn't necessarily be compliant, but it's kind of dumb because it, those configuration settings are just being set up in a different way. So this is a very long-winded way of saying that today, neither the CIS spec nor Qbench support the configuration mechanism that EKS uses. But that will change going forward because obviously we expect more people to move to that uh, config file in addition to, to EKS. Uh, I hope that answered the, the question in quite a roundabout way. Okay. Um, if that question comes back, I will ask you again. But um, you know what I took away from this was it is possible, but it takes a little bit more effort. And what you can do there is a little bit, little bit limited. Like it won't show everything. Is that is that correct? That that's true. And for EKS in particular, I would I would very much um, pause on worrying about things that failed. If you ran, you know, it, yeah. it may well be perfectly well configured, but we're just not seeing those results today. That will improve, but not overnight. Okay. Uh, another question with Cube Bench. Did you guys consider an existing framework like InSpec instead? Are there certain edge cases where InSpec doesn't work well? Uh, I'm afraid I'm not actually familiar with InSpec, so uh, I don't really know how to answer that question. Um, I, I suppose the answer is no, we didn't consider it because we're not familiar with it. 
Yeah, in all my investigation in uh, security as well, uh, I'm afraid to say that I did not uh, come across this either. Uh, so, uh, but you know, since it was mentioned, I'll go check it out and see what it is. But for right now, the answer is no. Uh, we did not, uh, or, or you guys did not look at it uh, when you were designing uh, Cubebench. And I think I also don't know the advantage or disadvantage of either. Okay. Same here. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is this doesn't seem like a like a security question, but let me just ask you: What scripts are you using to run Kubernetes on Vagrant? <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to answer that question. Um, I wrote a an article about this. If you Google basically my name and Kubernetes and Vagrant, I think you will find uh, an article that explains uh, how I set that up. And there's a link to the Vagrant file that I use. Um, it's, it's really very simple. It just you know sets up an Ubuntu box and installs Docker and runs some scripts to install Kubernetes. OK. And this last question, you know, I'm going to then let you continue. There are more, but I, I can't like, you know, stop you forever. So let me just continue. Uh, so last question, does Kubebench work with RKE clusters? And I wonder if you have tried it, Liz? Um, funnily enough, I was actually having a little go of uh, trying things with Rancher earlier today. I ran out of time to, uh, to get that up and running. Uh, I think it will need some uh, tweaks to the configuration to, uh, to get that working. Uh, but I think the, the, the underlying tests will, you know, it should be possible to get that. Uh, yeah, and, and I thought I ran, um, I ran it and, and you know, it, uh, and I can't remember if I, if I ran it against an RKE cluster or another cluster that I just created, but um, I think it went through fine uh, without any problems. Like it showed me what was missing. So it, it just worked out of the box, but um, well, let's see uh, if you can finish that, then we can probably have a better answer and write a blog or something about that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, if if anyone out there, you know, tries it and finds that it doesn't work, we are more than happy to take, you know, issues on GitHub and uh, and try to get to the bottom of that. Uh, OK, one more question, and I think this is interesting, so I will take it. Um, CIS benchmark is pretty strict. Like it asks for you, uh, it asks you to, uh, you know, lock down your containers, like no privileged containers, no root access, all these things. However, when in the real world that it doesn't work that way because apps do ask for root containers sometimes, for example. So how, you know, how do you kind of, on one hand, we talk about preventive security. On the other hand, there are all these limits that applications themselves enforce on containers. So how, how, how do you resolve this? Yeah, I, that's really what I was uh, trying to get at when I was saying, uh, you know, you need to at least try to understand why you might fail, you know, you might decide that failing a particular test or a particular recommendation from the CIS, you might decide that's okay, but you should at least, I, in my view, I think it's a good idea to understand why that's acceptable. The um, uh, allowing privileged containers is a really great example. Um, the, the CIS benchmark basically says, don't allow any. The reality is that kubeDNS, I think it's kubeDNS or is it kubeProxy, one of those at least, um, needs to run as a privileged container. And you know, that is very often an essential part of your, uh, of your cluster. Um, so you may want to take that with a with a pinch of salt and say, okay, we should probably not allow other privileged containers, but you might have a really good reason to to run privileged containers. Now, I would say with my kind of um, you know general security hat on, you shouldn't run containers with privileges that they don't need. If, if you really need to run a, a container as privileged. There are some occasions where that's necessary, but in an awful lot of cases, you probably don't need privilege flag. And perhaps you can take that, that guideline, that CIS benchmark as a kind of flag to say, well, what privilege containers do we have and do we really need them to be privileged? Is there something we can do to remove those privileges? The reason why I'd advise that is suppose it is 
in some way compromised. And perhaps it is, uh, it's a piece of application code, maybe it's got a dependency, it turns out that that dependency has a, an exploitable vulnerability. Somebody exploits your application code or they exploit your pod, exploit, they get into your container essentially. And if that container has additional privileges, it could very well be game over for your, for your whole cluster. Whereas if compromising the container, you know, if you can minimize the blast radius of that compromise, you are in a better position. So that's the reason to kind of pause on privileges. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on. We don't have that much time left. So um, okay. Thank, right. Thanks for answering the questions. They were they were it, it made a lot of sense to do that at this time. I think so. And thank you for asking the questions, members of the audience. <laughs> Okay, right, so let's uh, talk a bit about Kubernetes penetration testing. So for uh, anyone who doesn't know, penetration testing is the idea that you act as an attacker would. What can you do? What could an attacker do if they tried to compromise your deployment in some way? And uh, with Kubernetes, there are some particular things that are an attacker might try to do. They would try to um, see whether they can access the, the ports that are used by the various different components, and they would see whether or not they can exploit the APIs that are exposed through those ports. So uh, in order to uh, kind of help with that, we have a tool called Cube Hunter, again, uh, an open source tool. And the idea of this is that you can run it against your own cluster and it will attempt to uh, access the different ports. Uh, it will attempt to uh, access APIs on those ports and it will report back what it's seen. You can either run that directly from the, the Hunter code or we also have a, a kind of online version that will give you a, a slightly more attractive uh, report viewer. And you can think of this as complementary to KubeBench. Uh, if KubeBench is telling you, you know, are you setting up the configuration parameters correctly, KubeHunter is saying, well, never mind what the spec says, what can we actually do if we try to access this cluster? And it, in many ways will be influenced not just by the Kubernetes configuration, but perhaps by other um, security tools, processes that you have uh, around your cluster. Obvious example would be a firewall. It, there could be ports that are accessible from inside the firewall, but if you run Kubehunter from outside the firewall, it can't get through and, and that's a good thing. That's uh, replicating what, a, what an attacker would see. So uh, again, here's a, a screenshot of uh, Cube Hunter, but we don't really want to see screenshots. We want to see a real, uh, a real version. So uh, this cluster that I was using before, um, I'll just check its IP address, and I'm pretty sure I know what it is. But yeah, 172.28.128.3. And I'm going to run Cube Hunter from uh, from my laptop, so it's as if it were a different. Uh, it, it's external because uh, the Kubernetes node is running inside a virtual machine. So Cube Hunter, and we'll just run it against that remote address. Okay, and this will just take a, a few moments to probe the different ports and addresses, and then it gives us a report showing us what it's been able to find. Uh, now, because I changed the setting on uh, the kubelet, it was able to find the kubelet API, so it knows that it's there. It's actually accessible through uh, two different ports. Uh, the 10250 port is the, the read-write port. There's also a, a read-only port on 10.255. And it's found a few things. It's saying, for example, the API server port is, is open to unauthenticated access. 
I'm running an extremely old version of Kubernetes, which has a critical vulnerability in it. Uh, and there are some things here that you might consider to be uh, problematic or not. So for example, I've been able to read the version number from the, this particular uh, deployment, the way I've got it set up. Uh, kind of following on from the question uh, earlier about privileged containers, it's found that there are some privileged uh, containers, including QProxy. So this is uh, showing, again, a set of uh, potential vulnerabilities. Some of these are you know, pretty bad. I mean, this critical CVE is, is very bad, and I should really update this, this node if I wasn't using it for demos. Um, other things you may consider to be okay. So this issue about unauthenticated access to the API server, this is a different API from the Kubler API. Now, uh, this is an interesting point of um, debate. Uh, generally speaking, uh, security people will say, well, you shouldn't allow unauthenticated access to APIs. But in reality, this API allows components to do health checking. And um, uh, that health checking, it, it could be quite onerous to ask all your application code to um, set up uh, authentication just so that it can check whether or not other um, nodes are, or, or sorry, other pods are, are healthy. So oh, the um, the recommendation these days is you can allow the API server to be uh, to, to allow unauthenticated access, but you should uh, use RBAC settings, role-based access control settings, to limit uh, so that unauthenticated access can only do a very, very small set of things across that API. Okay. So uh, um, this is a, a view of that uh, kind of online viewer that I was talking about. Again, it's the same information, really. It's uh, just presented in a nicer way. Now, the interesting thing, I think, is when you run these two things kind of together, if we have uh, Cubebench telling us about the uh, sort of theoretical uh, or the, you know, how we think the config should be set up, and Cube Hunter telling us, in practice, what can I do given the, uh, the configuration? So uh, we, can, we can look at this uh, in screenshots, and I can also show it that anonymous authentication on the kubelet argument that we uh, that we fixed before we would also be able to see the corresponding uh, uh, attack we've fixed this before we would also see the um i uh, haven't got this right screenshot so i'm going to have to show it live and that's fine um so if i go back to that cluster and i uh, edit the same uh, file that we had before, and I turn anonymous authentication back on again. Uh, and I need to restart the cubeless again. And we'll oops, Q control get nodes and we'll wait for that node to be ready, which hopefully only take a few seconds. There it is. So if I run oh we can see here the previous time I ran Cube Hunter, we could see unauthenticated access to the API server. Now I'm going to run it again, and hopefully oops, we will see unauthenticated access to the kubelet as well. So let's check. And there it is. This is the, the kubelet port, the 10250, and we can see the kubelet is misconfigured, allowing uh, access to uh, 
well, anonymous access to the, the Kubelet API. So there's one more thing that we can do with Kubehunter, and that is to run it inside a pod within your cluster. And what that is really replicating is what an attacker could do if they manage to compromise some of your application code. So uh, as uh, in, this is the sort of scenario I was describing before, where perhaps you're running application code that happens to have a vulnerability and an attacker is able to exploit that vulnerability. So they get into a container that's inside a pod, and the question is, what can they do from there? The interesting thing here is that by default, Every pod, well, no, every pod runs under a service account. And the service account uh, in Kubernetes indicates what access control uh, is accessible to that to the pod, and the um, the service account is identified by a token. By default, the application code running inside a pod can read the token. And then it could use that token to authenticate to the API. What that means is, depending on the permissions, the, the, the access that's been permitted to the service account that you're using, you might have additional permissions to access the API server using that token. So we can we can see what I mean by uh, I think it's here. Yeah, so I am going to just check I haven't got any pods, right. And I'm going to apply a, a bit of YAML here. And the main thing I'm doing is I'm, uh, well, I have a, a, a service account which has what I've called superpowers. I've, I've given this service account a lot of access on a, a lot of RBAC access. And I've started a pod with, which is associated with that service account. So if I uh, exit into that pod, I just run a shell. So this is me running a shell inside the pod and I'm just going to hit the Kubernetes API. So I can use uh, curl and we can look at Kubernetes. And I'm, it's, I'm anonymous. And if I try to, uh, I probably can see something at the API level, but uh, if I do something like look for the pods in the system, it's forbidden. System anonymous is not allowed to look at pods. But I can, let's clear the screen, uh, I can get hold of a token, and that's stored inside a secret that's accessible inside the pod at a well-known location, uh, service account token, so now I have a token, and if I run the same request, the same API request that I did before, but this time I pass in a header, authorization header, with a bearer token, which we've just read out of that secret. Now, with the use of that token, I can see all sorts of pods, and in fact I can do all sorts of things across that API. And uh, the idea of running Kubehunter inside a pod is that you can take advantage of whatever service account uh, you have and see what that would allow you to do. Uh, so uh, if I apply my Kubernetes, let me just check that that has got the right service account. Yeah, that's using superpower. So if I apply my Kubehunter uh, 
support. And this is going to take, I think, about 30 seconds or so to uh, run. Uh, okay, so QFunter is now running, and we basically need to let that uh, run to completion. And then we'll be able to look at the logs and see the output from QPunter. And hopefully we will see some additional things that we weren't able to see by running QPunter externally. So hopefully that will finish up any second now. Of course, live, but there it is, it's finished. So now we can get the logs from that pod and that will give us the output. And we can see that there are several other things that we were able to do. We were able to access the API using the service account token, and we were able to do things like uh, listing roles, listing pods, listing namespaces, all sorts of things we were able to do through the use of that service account token. Now, there's one other thing that I'll uh, mention. I've I've only got uh, vulnerabilities here saying that we can list information, we can read information off that API. By default, KubeHunter will only do what we call passive tests, so it will try to read information, uh, and it won't do anything that changes the state of your cluster. We do have some additional uh, checks that you can enable using uh, an active flag, and that will attempt to uh, potentially change things in your cluster by uh, attempting to do things like posts and patch state changing API requests. Uh, so that can uh, reveal, we try not to destroy any uh, you know, pods that we didn't previously create, um, but I would definitely recommend using the active flag with, with care, but that can be a, a very powerful way of, of checking what an attacker could do if they were able to get inside your pod and what they could do with service account token that uh, a pod might be using. So the results that you get inside a pod will depend on the service account that's associated with that pod. So you may use different service accounts for different pieces of application code, and you might want to use KeyHunter to test uh, what's possible with each of those service accounts. Also, just bear in mind, you know, this is testing a kind of what if scenario. It may not be applicable to everybody. This is what happens if somebody exploits your code and is able to you know, take advantage of a vulnerability, the kind of um, things like shell shock um, or heart bleed, where um, an attacker is able to um, compromise your application code. Having done that, so it's a bit of a what if, then what else could they do? If you're interested in either of those tools, um, you'll, you'll find them on the Aqua Security GitHub uh, site. And uh, with that, I hope we've got some questions about KeepHunter. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, but let me get uh, started with the questions. You know, one is um, for people who have AquaSec as a tool, uh, like they understand that KubeBench and KubeHunter are free and open source to use, so, so they can just navigate search for them, navigate, download, use. But for those who have AquaSec, are the tools kind of built into AquaSec? Or, I mean, do you guys have, um, uh, you know, let's call that um, uh, sort of an enterprise version of these tools? Or how does it work? Right. So uh, KubeBench is built into uh, the Aqua platform today. Uh, and I think it's likely that we'll see KubeHunter built in uh, in the near future. I don't think it is in there today. No, I'm sure it's not there today, but uh, that may come. Okay. Um, and there's a question about AquaSec deployment, like how does it get deployed? Is AquaSec product implemented in infrastructure? Is it outside the K8 in Kubernetes infrastructure? 
like like how does it get deployed i know the answer because i've used ecosec but why didn't you <laughs> Okay. Hey, you should answer. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, Aqua can be deployed, well, it, it is deployed as containers. Um, we can, we, we have Helm charts, for example, so to make it easy to, to deploy on Kubernetes. We're actually um, uh, orchestrator agnostic, so although there's lots of things that um, are, uh, you, that relate to Kubernetes, you can run Aqua on uh, other orchestrators, you can run Aqua on a uh, container deployment with no orchestrator if, if that's what you're doing. We're not oh, no. No. fully dependent, we're not actually dependent on Kubernetes per se. But obviously a lot of people are using Kubernetes and uh, yeah, it's, it's a simple matter of deploying a Helm chart. And then what you get is uh, a set of um, uh, kind of, well there's a, a a main uh, web, or well, there's a, a UI component, a UI container. There's what we call a gateway, which uh, you can have one or more instances of, so that enables us to scale to very, very large deployments by having multiple gateways. And every node in the cluster would have uh, what we call an enforcer running on it. So the enforcer does the actual job of policing what's allowed to happen um, as containers uh, start and stop and as they're executing. Uh, the, each enforcer will be in communication with one of these gateways, uh, and then the gateways are all um, uh, communicating with, uh, well, the, they share a managed database. So Postgres database, typically you, know, you would use a, a managed database uh, to hold all the profile information uh, and I think that is a very quick overview of how Aqua looks from a kind of component. Yeah. Uh, you know, my simplified way of thinking about this is it's more like a server plus agent model. And, uh, you know, all the enforcers that you're talking about, they are agents, they get deployed on each node. Um, exactly. And yeah. send information to the central console or, or central server. and then you have your own IP, you basically um, uh, navigate to that on your host and, and you have the whole console and um, uh, there you can do all the settings uh, uh, and for like develop policies and then then you know start monitoring and, and uh, uh, protecting your Kubernetes from there on. So it's more like a server and agent model. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a question there is, uh, what happens if you have multiple clusters? Are you gonna deploy different consoles or different servers? And then for each one, you have a completely different setup or can a single console manage all the different Kubernetes clusters? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I am... No problem. Now, yeah, I, I think you could because uh, because of the fact that we're not sort of inherently tied into the Kubernetes structure. I think there, there's no reason why you couldn't have yeah. a single app deployment across multiple Kubernetes clusters. We do also have a, a multi-tenancy feature, which has allowed you to um, kind of I'm, going to, I'm not quite sure whether the right terminology is subcontract, but you, you can have um, uh, you can have a hierarchy of um, profiles and security settings that, that maybe there's a kind of global policy and then and uh, then you might have individual policies for different teams or for different um, parts of the deployment or for different applications or, or what have you. Okay, coming back to the open source world, um, there's a question about Docker CIS benchmarks, and the question is not very specific, so it's it's a difficult to kind of answer it. It's very open-ended, and all it says is, what about Docker CIS benchmarks related to container security? Can you share your insights? Right, so we do have a, a, a similar tool to uh, Qbench called DockerBench, uh, and it runs the, the CIS benchmarks with Docker. I'm less familiar with the details of what's actually in the, the spec for, for the Docker benchmark, uh, but I do know that the, those results are, are reported into the Aqua console as well. 
Okay, I let me just type it up. I'm sending it to the gentleman who asked it. Um, again, this is not a question. It's more like a comment. Uh, somebody said, I would liken this to Bestial Linux, but for containers and on steroids. Um, I have not used Bestial Linux, but if you have, Liz? No, I'm not familiar with that either, but um, I, that sounds like a compliment, so I'll, <laughs> I'll take it that way. <laughs> Okay, speaking of compliments, I think I'll, we are already over time. So the last one, somebody started this. Thank you for the webinar. I love your Kubernetes security book. I read oh, it 10 thank times. <laughs> thank oh, you for the amazing efforts and advocacy on Kubernetes security. Oh, so that's very just, nice. a, just a comment. Um, uh, somebody mentioned it. And by the way, for those of you who haven't, please do search for Liz Rice and the book that she mentioned early on. I have read it as well. It's a very good place for you to get started on Kubernetes security. Security in Kubernetes is a complex issue. And even the definition of what it means to secure your Kubernetes cluster is under um, you know, some sort of, um, uh, uh, I'll say, debate. Different people think of it as, as different things. Uh, but wherever you can start, start. Uh, it's important. It's urgent. Uh, if you are working with Kubernetes and the book uh, that that is being mentioned here, written by Liz Rice and her co-author, uh, is a very good place to get started. Well, thank you very much. It's very kind, and thank you All for right. having me on today's uh, webinar. Okay, thank you very much uh, for joining. And the recording of this uh, webinar will be available on our website. I sent out a link earlier. If you haven't seen it or didn't get it, please just search for Kubernetes Masterclass Series uh, with Rancher.com, and it will take you to a page where we list the whole calendar as well as the recordings of the past sessions. I hope to see you all again next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.